Acts chapter 2, verses um, 42 through 47, it describes what, what it will look like as we jump in and dive deep, as we follow the Lord to go wherever He wants us to go, to do whatever He wants us to do, to say whatever He wants us to say, to whoever He wants us to say it. There's freedom in that, right? If Jesus says, I want you to do this, and even though it's fearful, we say, yes, there's freedom because I'm, I'm following no one but my king. And he provides for us in amazing ways. Yesterday, we spent as an elder team and pastoral team, nine o'clock to two, two in the afternoon in prayer just for this body that God would enable us by the power of the Holy Spirit to go deeper to experience all there is of God and to know moment by moment, day by day, that even as we go deeper with him, in the words of Corey Tim Boom, he is deeper still. But I want to tell you this as we begin our message this morning, there is a cost to go deeper. Everything has a cost. There's a price to pay. We pay a cost for backsliding in our faith. I mean, sometimes in our walk with Christ, we think just like water, we'll just go to the place of point of least resistance. I mean, that's true about water, right? You let water run, it goes to the place of least resistance. Same is true in electricity. Same is true in our life as Christians. We're kind of like dead salmon being drawn by, by the stream or dying salmon, you know. Just wherever the the tide takes us, we'll go. There's a cost to having a commitment that simply says, I'm not committed. I'm backslidden. I really don't care. I'll just let things float. There's a cost to pay. And I don't think we're going to be loving the outcome. Churches sometimes do that. They just get into free flow. As I shared a number of weeks ago, a Scottish friend of mine said, you Americans are so good. You come before God and ask him for a system to lead and guide your church, and then God gives you a system, and then we say we no longer need the Holy Spirit. We've got the system. And we just kind of set it in cruise. And it's easy for us to do that as believers, isn't it? We set it in cruise, you know, 8 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon, boom, and then it's Fox News after that, chick few chicken legs, go to bed, get up, let it's just cruise. And we got Sunday again. I don't want to live that kind of life. I don't want to backslide in my faith. I want to grow. Some people don't like change. Change is uncomfortable. However, all of us pay a cost for trying to stop change. You pay a cost for trying to, for trying to stay the same. In fact, we've said it before, the only thing that doesn't change is change. But really, the character of God never changes and his word never changes, right? Jesus said this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will never pass away. God's word never changes. And the Bible calls us, in fact, part of the will of God is that we change. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, creation. Old things are in process of passing away. Behold, all things are becoming new. That's change. And we say, "I I really don't like the new that God has for me. Well, then... You're backsliding and you're in the flesh and there's a cost to pay for that. There's a cost to pay to try to stop change. I want to change. I want to grow. I want to go deeper with God. And the best, most effective way to go deeper with God is to go deeper together. Yes, there's a cost to grow deeper and to move forward. But it's a cost we are willing to pay, are we not? All of us as a body, are we not willing to say, God, let us go where you want us to go. Let us do what you want us to do. Let us say what you want us to say. Let us be who you want us to be. Amen? Amen. I'm assuming that we're all saying that's exactly what we want. But I want to share with you collectively, there will be a cost. It's a delightful cost because the outcome is what we all want. And that is to be exactly and do exactly what God has called us to do. And when that's over, guess what? God gets the glory, doesn't he? In Acts chapter 2, we find a church just like that. 
It's right after the day of Pentecost. It's not a small church. It's a large church. After the day of Pentecost, how many people came to Christ? You guys remember? 3,000. They were baptized. There was probably about 500 believers prior to that. So you go 500 to 3,000. That sounds a little bit like Parkside. What would you guys think if next week we had 3,000 people here? Some of you would be upset. Who's in my parking spot? Where are all these people? You're in my seat. You know, this is my seat. I've been sitting here for 15 years. I've had that happen. I was at a church in a land far, far away you know not of. And we were meeting as a board, and the board says, you know, I'm a brand new pastor. I was like 28 years old, scared to death. And the, the board says, we've got to grow. We've got to grow. And we begin to pray. Pray, God, please add to your church daily. We begin to teach the word of God. We begin to minister to the people in the community. And before you know it, the place was packed. We have to build a new building. And I, I'll never forget it. We, we went to two services, and they were packed out. And there was this dear woman. I, I'll never forget this. I wish I had a camera on my phone that I could take a picture of it, and I'd have it. But they weren't invented yet. In fact, we didn't even have cell phones, so we had to go to... Anyway, I don't want to talk about that. But, but <clears throat> anyways, th this woman... There was not enough pew for her backside. You understand what I'm saying? And uh, that's when churches had pews. We don't call them pews anymore because if you sit too long in a pew, that's why they call them pews. You get rancid and it's like, oh, it stinks. That's why they call them pews. Did you know that? You got to get up out of the pew, move into the community. Some of you are not laughing and I need to move on. All right, here we go. But I said to the board, this is so exciting. And one of the board members says, where are all these people coming from? We, I don't like this. Our little church is no longer our little. Listen, it's not our church. It's his. Amen? And I really believe within the next year, a year and a half, two years, Parkside will have over 1,000 people in it. I really believe it. And the reason why I believe it is because God's bringing in new communities. And if we don't reach them, we'll be der derelict in what God has called us to do. Right? That means there's a cost involved, there's giving up a seat, there's moving, there's maybe parking out to school because there's no, I'm telling you this, God wants us to go deeper with him. As we go deeper with him, we'll reach more with the good news of Christ. And it's really not about us, it's about all churches in this community. We pray that God will bless every church that is preaching the word of God. We're going to partner with them to help reach this community with the good news of Jesus. And it's not going to be same old, same old because we've paid a cost for being same old, same old. And I don't want to be there, do you? I don't think anybody in our church wants to be there. We want to be the church that God has called us to be. And in this passage, in Acts chapter 2, there are four necessary ingredients for that to happen. It's kind of like the four, got to do this, must be a part of your church. If you don't have all four, it's sort of like sitting on a four-legged stool that's missing a, stool, uh, a leg, right? It's wobbly. You go, oh, we could do two things really well. Well, then you're like sitting on a stool that's only got two legs, and then you're leaning, and it's not very comfortable. We want to do all four for the glory and honor of God. The first ingredient to go deeper is found in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2 and verse 46 of Acts chapter 2. So you have your Bibles. Please have them open. It says in Acts 2, 42, and they, who's they? The believers from the previous context, all those who came to faith, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So First premise from Acts chapter 2 to going deeper together as a community is a devotion to God's truth, the Word of God. It's called, in Acts chapter 2, the Apostles' Teaching. That word devoted carries with it the idea of steadfastness, an unchanging commitment. This one thing we do. So what is the Apostles' Teaching? Let's remember, these believers don't have New Testaments. They don't have any study Bibles. They don't have any Ryrie study Bibles, MacArthur study Bibles, NIV study Bibles. They don't have podcasts. They don't have YouTube. Go, hey, did you see, hear this guy? This guy's awesome. Listen to this guy. They don't have any of that. What do they have? They have the Older Testament. 
They also have the words and teaching of Jesus, not yet written, but they would soon be written down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit or under the direction of the Holy Spirit. They had first-hand accounts and teaching the disciples received from their time with Jesus after the resurrection, before the resurrection. And it would not be long, maybe seven to eight years, before the first gospel would be written, probably Mark, perhaps Matthew, then not long after that, the first epistle, 1 Corinthians. But they only had the Old Testament. We see this evidence in Stephen's life when he's taken, when he's arrested, Acts chapter 7, he is tried and he is stoned. And guess what he teaches, what he, he preaches? It's all Old Testament scriptures. Why? Because the Old Testament points to the coming Messiah, that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as prophesied beginning in Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the book of Malachi. The reason why Stephen quotes Old Testament scripture to give the gospel is because the whole redemptive story of the New Testament is found prophesied in the Older Testament. That's why we believe that preaching Genesis to Revelation and everything in between is profitable for us as believers. Even the minor prophets. Can I get an amen? I know it's difficult. People say, the minor prophets are so hard. We, it, yeah, but it's the word of God and it is profitable for our instruction, for our doctrine, for even our reproof. That's why we believe every single book in the word of God is inspired and inerrant by God and is given to us and we are devoted to it. If it doesn't, if it doesn't, isn't found in Scripture, we don't want it. So many guys who, hey, I got a new revelation. Nah, that new revelation better be consistent with this one, or it's in error. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us, in these last days, God has spoken to us in numerous ways through prophets and so forth. But in these last days, God has spoken to us in and through His Son, and that phraseology there, it is finished, it is final, there is no new revelation. And by the way, if a guy comes up to me and says, God wants me to do so and so and so and so, I say, chapter and verse that, baby. I had a guy come up to me one time, he says, I know God wants me to divorce my wife. I said, chapter and verse that one. He says, she doesn't make me happy. <sighs> That's not what the Bible says about marriage, is it? She don't make you happy, get a new one. I don't find that in Scripture. So that's what we're about. If you're here this morning visiting, you go, what is this church about? We're about being devoted to the Word of God. We may do it imperfectly, and we repent for that, but it really broke my heart this week to read about the Methodist church. You guys, some of you had Methodist background, and they're dividing. They're dividing over... Uh, sexual issues. And I thought, that's not what the church is about. The church is not about sexual issues. The church is about the Word of God and what the Word of God has to say about sexual issues. And we know that we all struggle. I mean, the, the ground is leveled to cross. But I will never divide with a believer over what the Bible has to say. I will divide with a believer or one who professes to be a believer if they say, uh, the Bible is really not important. We want to go with what culture is saying. I'll tell you this. The Bible counters our culture. You want to be countercultural? Follow Jesus. <laughs> now you can get all tatted out. Do whatever you want to do. I mean, it's okay. It, I love, God loves all kinds of people. Red, yellow, black, and white, and all kinds of insignias and everything else all over the body. It's okay. But you want to be countercultural? You pick up the Word of God and you start following it. And you will run headstrong into a culture that does not embrace your life. Because we're not of this world. The believers, these new believers in Acts chapter 2, not only were devoted to the disciples' teaching, and we must be devoted to it by the power of the Holy Spirit, not only to study it and understand it, but do it, and do it on a daily basis. It was a daily devotion. It says in verse 40, 46, 
They, day by day, attended the temple. They gathered together as a body of believers, and then they scattered into smaller groups. We'll talk about that in a moment. But Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, 2. Like newborn babes, long for the pure spiritual milk of the word so that you may grow up in your salvation. Peter reminds us that we cannot survive without food. And I think every one of us has that down. But so too that we cannot survive without food, we cannot survive without spiritual food. That's why Peter says, like newborn babes, long for the spiritual milk of the word, that you may grow up in your salvation. That word long has a continual present tense, continue to long for the word. I put it like this, one week, W-E-E-K, without the word of God makes one W-E-A-K. There's no wonder that the number of cults that are out there, pseudo-Christian cults, they're the ones that knock on your door and say, hello, yes, we're Christians. No, you're not. Because you deny the deity of the Lord Jesus, you deny the word of God, you deny the death and burial of Christ, you deny the, the reality of the resurrection. Many people say, oh, he rose, but he only rose spiritually. No, he rose physically. That's what the Bible says. You say you claim to follow Christ, yet you deny the foundational truths of the word of God. You're not a follower of Jesus It's a false following. Is it any wonder that the majority, some say as high as 70% of people who are a part of these pseudo-Christian cult churches came out of evangelical churches? I ask the question, why did they come out of evangelical churches? Because we're really good on preaching the gospel. Jesus died for you. Yes, yes, yes. Or maybe we're not so good. But we're not that good on training and devoting our people to, to just basically be led and fed daily by the word of God. How do you know if something's a counterfeit or not? You got to know the word. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you. We must, when we're cut, we must bleed Bible. And not just simply that our heads are filled. I've seen people like that. It's almost like a spiritual, you know, litmus test. Like, what, can you quote this passage, this question? I mean, it's great to be able to quote it, but men and women, we're not called not only to quote it, we're called to live it in repentant faith by the power of the Holy Spirit in humbleness. Say, I want to live this word. I want to do what it says, not just, you know, be able to quote it. I'll never forget the true story of a kid is it was a youth group, and he was made treasurer of the group, and he could quote scripture. You remember the ministry Awana? It's a great, it's a great ministry. It's all about scripture memory. It's really wonderful. But this kid was a, a, just, he was amazing at scripture memory. But um, it, disco- it was discovered that some money was being pilfered from the offering. And the youth pastor finally says, I got to confront this guy. He confronted this kid, and he said, are you stealing money from the offering? Kid kind of looked. He did the left, left eye look. You know what I mean? You guys know what that is? You say, do you do something? And all of a sudden, their eyes, their eyes go like this. And he said, you've stolen money? He said, you're the best scripture memorizer that I have. You've won numerous awards and a lot of scripture memory. And the kid says, yeah, but what's that got to do with anything? See, that's only head knowledge, right? Sometimes people miss heaven by 18 inches, right? They know it in their head, but they don't know Jesus in their heart. They know the truths of Scripture in their head, but they don't know Christ in their heart. We're called as men and women to know the Word of God and let it filter through our heads into our heart and to our whole being. To be daily devoted to the Word. I know we have a hard time sometimes daily reading and feeding in the Bible, but I will tell you this. If you have questions about what plan to use, how do I get into the Bible on a daily basis, if you have a smartphone, they're really smart because there's tons of apps that you can have on your phone that give you a little reminder every day, hey, it's time to read. And by the way, there's also application there. And don't say, I haven't been to Bible college. Oh, I hate that. I ain't been to Bible college. That's not an excuse. By the way, if you want to be a part of a Bible college, God is allowing Parkside to start one. Amen. You want to be a part of a Bible college, we have classes starting February the 11th. If somebody says that to you anymore, I'm not part of a Bible college. Well, I have a plan. God loves you, and I have a wonderful plan for your life. 
$100 a credit hour, Arizona Christian University. Professor Mike Rich is going to be teaching. Can I give a yo-hoo? And I'm really excited about it. We have, I think, about 10 students already involved. But there's a process you heard last week from Jason. you got to send a little note to our folks at ACU. We don't handle the finances. But please, if you'd like to be a part of a Bible college training and equipping, let us know. The issue really is to feed and read daily. That's what the Jerusalem church did. And what's amazing, this passage, is they did it together. A lot of times we have our lone Christians, we do this, this, but they did it together. I think there was a sense of accountability. And that togetherness is the ne- next necessary main ingredient to go deeper. It's the word fellowship. Fellowship. It's the English word translated from the Greek word koinonia. And when I was growing up in my Baptist church, we had a koinonia Sunday school class. Everybody remember the koinonia? We're called koinonia. What does that mean? I don't know. But it's a good class. It's biblical koinonia. I thought maybe it's the people with all the coins. I don't know because they were older folks. And this is just how my young mind worked as a teenager. Finally, I found out that the word koinonia means fellowship. Then I had to ask somebody, what does that mean? He says, well, I think it's like two fellows in the same ship. And that's not biblical either. I mean, it kind of is. If you're going in the same direction, you're together, right? But there's often more than two. There's many. The word fellowship speaks of community. It speaks of unity. It speaks of going together in the same direction. And they were committed to the fellowship. And that fellowship was evidenced in two ways in this passage. I was going to put up four fingers. That's really not good. Two ways. The first way was in open homes. They had open homes. Look at verse 42. Again, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, right? The breaking of bread and prayer. And then also verse 46, and day by day, attending the temple together. That's the the body gathered. Can you imagine 3,500, 4,000 people gathering in the temple every day, breaking bread? Then in their homes, they scattered. They studied the word both together, but they also studied the word in their homes. And they broke bread. They had fellowship. That word breaking bread is interesting. It's used in the Bible really in two ways. One relates to having a meal together. Isn't it interesting how Jesus fed people when he was teaching them? And every night that we have life group, We have a meal. I want to encourage you, we have open homes at Parkside, and they're open to everyone. You say, what's a life group? Well, we meet during the week. Life stands for something. Did you know that? It's an acrostic. L stands for love. I stands for instruction. F stands for food. (laughs) No, it doesn't. Actually, it stands for fellowship. But they're kind of, you know, synonymous. Isn't it true that you can have real fellowship when you're just having something to eat with somebody? Be able to begin to talk? I don't know what it is about, you know, a Big Mac and fries. It just kind of opens the lips. We begin to talk about the things that are going on. It closes our hearts, but it opens our mouth, maybe. But I know on Sunday night I'm going to be eating good. Why? Because I have life group on Sunday night. And I want to encourage each and every one of you to join and be a part of a life group. What's the purpose of the life group? To pray together, to study the Word of God together, to be discipled, to be encouraged, and to have fellowship. We have life groups that are open, and if you want to join a life group, all you need to do is call our church office, say, I want to join a life group. Here's the night I'm available, and we want to hook you up. Here's a little uh, ad campaign tagline that I thought was so creative as I was studying for this passage. Are you ready for it? Ready? Here it is. Life groups, don't leave church without them. You like that one? Yeah, thank you. All three of you. I appreciate it. Let's meet after and we'll pray. (laughs) But not only were the homes open to Jerusalem church, they also had open hands. Open hands, quite literally, speak of generosity and gratitude. Look at verse 44. This is key. A lot of these, these passages speak about the giving nature, the commonality of the believers. 
And they all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had what? Need. That's a key word. As any had need. Open hands equals generosity and gratitude. It's hard to give something away to meet a need if you got a death grip on it. Never forget, I've shared this story before. I'm going to share it again. We were in a building program of the church that I was involved with in Mesa. And somebody gave me, ladies and gentlemen, do you hear that? Somebody gave me a 40 Ford Coupe. It was in real need. And, uh, man, I was like, this is the most exciting thing in all the world. And I'm trying to think of all the money it's going to cost to bring this thing up. And my wife says these magic words to me. Do you think the Lord gave that to us so we could sell it and give it to the building program? I said, no. <laughs> I'm like hanging on to it. No. You peel my dead fingers off this 44 coop. And then the Spirit of God said, that's why I gave it to you, Jim. And I said, okay. Every time I see a 44 coop driving down the road, I say, that could have been mine. But I gave it to the Lord. Amen. But I'll tell you this, everything belongs to God, right? I don't have a 40 Ford Coupe. God had it. God gave it to me, and God gave it to me for a purpose. And God, everything that you have has been given to you for a purpose. And the harder you cling on to it, the more difficult it is to give it away, especially when needs are there. May I say a word of encouragement to my brothers and sisters at Parkside? There has never been a need that I know of since we've had the joy of being a part of this family, that this fellowship has not met. And I say that all to the honor and glory and praise of God. It's called stewardship, not ownership. Last year, God allowed us to help more people with more counsel, more goods, more financial help, and I mean financial help with groceries, maybe paying the rents when just things were really tight than we ever have before. We value having open hands. We call that value stewardship. And those open hands also come with open accountability. Later on in the New Testament, people were abusing the generosity of the church family. And that's why Paul writes about the importance of work. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 11, he says, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command. He's writing to the Thessalonian believers. If we were with you, we would have told you this. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not, what? Eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness. Not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such people we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living. It's a desire of this fellowship to use our hands to help others meet their needs. And that literally means, as often said, we want to give a hand up, not a hand out. It's not like, hey, you know, the door is open. I'll never forget it. Another church in a land, land far away, we used to give $50 prize gift cards for people in need. A person called up and said, we've really had a hard month. We didn't know these people. And could you help us with groceries? Absolutely. So we didn't have the prize gift card. I had to send a secretary over, pick some up. And uh, in the meantime, I had another person call me. And they said, hey, is this a church giving away free prize gift cards? Uh, there's accountability. And that's the way it was in the local church, and that's why Paul had to instruct it, because isn't it true the flesh often takes over, and we need that instruction, we need that help? I want to share with you a need, a need of our body. There's never been a need this, this church has not met. We have a need. I'll tell you what the need is. I mean, we have a lot of them, but one is really pressing, and that is need for more educational space. We just need it. We, don't, we only have one, really one 
usable room for adult education. So we've been praying about a modular. I shared that with you about a year ago. And we thought we had one, and it didn't happen. And we have need for a modular unit. Be great to have two of them. I mean, usually they're about 3,000 square feet. Modulars are easier to set up, but we want to have a modular unit so we can have space to disciple more men and women, young men and women, with the good news of Christ. And as you know, we have space needs. So if God's laid on your heart this morning to say, I'd like to partner with that. There's no need that God has not met. You just come up, talk with me or one of the elders and say, God has laid on our heart. We want to help meet that need. Because that's the way God does things. To the honor and glory of what? God. I just thought I'd share that with you. So here we are, committed, devoted to the word, committed to the fellowship. The third necessary ingredient in deeper community as a church body is this, surrendered in worship. You'd say, I think surrendered in worship should be first. Well, chronologically in this passage, devoted to the scripture is first. Why? Because if you don't know the God of the Bible, how can you worship him? And if you're divided... In your fellowship, worship gets constrained, doesn't it? You ever been a part of a church that divides because the fellowship is at odds with one another? I mean, we sing that song, blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, and as one writer said, and yet we let the slightest offense divide us. God forbid, I rebuke the enemy in the name and power and the authority of Christ. This place is not his place. This place belongs to Jesus, and we will, as the power of God enables us to, be a united fellowship until Christ comes for us. And I'll tell you why. We're going to keep our eyes fixed and focused on Christ. We want to do what he wants us to do. And we want to be surrendered in worship. That word worship comes from the old English word worth-ship. It means that the number one priority in the life of our church is God and God alone. Our vision statement says it very clearly. We are to be centered on Christ. It's his church. Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's often when his church becomes our church that problems happen, don't they? We're stewards, not owners. It's his Never forget a guy coming in my office one time, not here, in another place, land far, far away in a church you know not of, and he was really angry, and he says, I don't like what you're doing to my church. And I said, well, first and foremost, let's sit down, let's talk. It's not yours. He said, what? It's not your church. I don't care if you were born here, baptized a three-year-old, which we don't do, by the way. If your parents are charter members, it doesn't matter. It's his church. And it will always be his. And all I'm asking you to do is help me in leadership to enable this church to do what the head of this church wants us to do. Will you join me to do that? And we left friends that day. We prayed together. And God bless and continue to bless that man's life. When we are surrendered in worship, that, by the way, is what worship is defined by. Romans 12, 1 and 2. That we surrender our lives as a what kind of sacrifice? A living sacrifice. That God shows up. At the, prom- the promise of Jesus' birth in Matthew 1, 23, his name is called Emmanuel. And Emmanuel literally means with us God. God's presence is among us when we surrender our lives to him. And when we surrender to the fullness of God, we surrender our lives to be what he wants us to be, to go where he wants us to go, to do what he wants us to do, to say what he wants us to say, then his fullness fills us. And that's what we want. That's who we want. He must increase and we must say it. That's right. And in that passage, it says that the church in Jerusalem had a sense of awe. And I'll tell you why it's a sense of awe is because God is present not only with us but in us bible tells us clearly do you not know that christ is in you the holy spirit is in you and when we come collectively being filled with the holy spirit then god's presence is powerfully experienced 
signs and wonders are also evidence in the Jerusalem church. To put it in another way, God was called upon an expectant faith to do what only God can do. And I'll tell you, the greatest miracle of all, and some people say, oh, no, it's not, but I'll tell you, it is. The greatest miracle of all is when someone comes to Christ. So many times people put healing on this pedestal, and I'll tell you, you can be healed and go straight to hell. By the way, our bodies are decaying, and I will tell you this, God still heals. We have seen God heal. We trust him to heal. And I was praying about this on Saturday. This next week, we're going to look at James chapter 5. You know, let the elders call and so forth, and that person prayer and faith will be healed. And I, I said, Lord, how does that work? You always answer prayer. You always heal. And the Spirit of God told me, I do always heal. Sometimes I heal the temporal body, and sometimes the body dies, and you go to be with Christ. And that is ultimate healing. That's what we celebrate. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The reason why I was struggling with this is because of an incident that I had experienced where a little girl got cancer. The pastor came and anointed the little girl, prayed for her, and said, in the name of Jesus, you are healed. A few weeks later, she slipped into a coma. She died. She, he, the pastor went back to talk to the man who's grieving over her lost, his lost daughter. And he said, what happened? How come my daughter died? You said that God would heal her if we trusted in faith. And the pastor said this to the man. The reason why she died is that you didn't have the faith. That's horrible. I'll tell you what. Our faith does not heal. God heals. And God heals he healed that little girl. She's completely whole. Sometimes God heals the temporal body. Sometimes God takes us home to be with him where I will forever be with the Lord. But when God is evidently present here, God does work. God heals. God will heal your marriage. But you have to come to him. You have to surrender everything to him. God will heal your home. God will heal your life. God will heal your future. God will heal your past. God will help you in whatever struggle you're in. But you have to come and surrender and worship. And not just say, I surrender some. It's, I surrender everything, Lord. Everything I am belongs to you. And when we do that, collectively as a body, God shows up and he does what only God can do. And when God does what only God can do, then God's evident praise is only for him. And that's what we want to do. My time is going out. But I want you to know this. Every day was a day to give praise to God. Acts 2. They praised God every day. And God inhabited the praise of his people. And because of that praise, God moved in the community. Look at the last and final point of the four necessary ingredients for deeper together as a community. And that is they were dedicated to discipleship. And that discipleship was involved in truth and relationship. People say, is there a difference between evangelism and discipleship? I don't really think so. I think that discipleship is a part of evangelism. You begin to share your faith. You begin to teach God's truth and call people to be followers of Christ. There is truth in relationship. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. But it's one thing to just be devoted to truth. That, that truth must be inherently woven in our relationships one to another. Rarely does someone come to Christ and be part of a community of a believer's uh, uh, church because of the dogmatic position they have on doctrine. So I want to come to Christ because they're so dogmatic on doctrine. I've rarely heard that to be true. Rarely does someone come to faith and become part of a church community because that church trusts scriptural memorization. Scriptural memorization is wonderful, but I rarely find people go, you know, I want to go to that church. It's, uh, they're really strong on scripture memorization. You know why people come to faith? Because of relationship. Because of love. They come to faith because you extended your hand. You extended your heart to someone in need. And you shared the only message of hope that they desperately need. The love of Christ that love that binds up brokenness is contagious. And that love, that gospel message has a place to invade. And when it invades, it transforms lives. The Bible tells us as a result of the four necessary ingredients produced in the 
are present in the Jerusalem church that the Lord daily added to his church. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And it's my prayer that God daily adds to his church in Camp Verde. Not only our church, but every church that proclaims the name of Jesus. Every day someone comes to faith. And maybe that day is for you today. I'd like the band to come forward as we close in singing. Maybe that day is for you. We have men and women who are going to join, come up and, and be here to pray with you. Because we believe that God answers prayer, don't you? Maybe you have prayer, in, in, a deep need of prayer in your life for healing. Maybe you have a deep need of prayer for your family. Maybe you have a deep need of prayer for salvation. You say, I don't know if I belong to Christ or not. Whatever the need is, we believe that God is calling us to pray for and seek his faith. Jesus said, all who come to me will in no wise be cast out. So as we close our singing together, we have individuals waiting to pray with you. You come and we will pray together. Let's sing. Stand with me as we close.